Hello, today um, I'm interviewing Erin Neelands, um, who is a, an artist and, and a singer and a guitarist and a, lots of other things, which she'll explain to you. Hi, Erin. Hello. So, yeah, explain a little bit about what you do, and then I'm going to bombard you with questions. Okay. It's a, it, that's a really tough question because, um, okay, I'll start with the obvious. Yes, I'm a singer and guitar player. I, I started singing at a very young age. Um, my mom tells me that when I was learning to speak, I used to sit in front of the radio and hum along to yeah. the music there. It was yeah. like my favorite place to be. And I, so, I sort of, she tells me that, and you know, you don't really have memories when you're very young, but I sort of feel like hmm. I can remember that, I can see that. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that, does, that makes sense to me. Um, and I got my first guitar when I was 14. I've never had a lesson or anything. I've taught myself everything. Um, and that, that's the big thing in, in my life. I've taught myself a lot of things. But, um, yeah, so that's the first and most obvious thing. I've been singing and playing the guitar because I love to do it. And also at the same time, the second most obvious thing is I started drawing. I had a friend in year five who was very good at drawing and her father was a, a graphic artist and he taught her how to draw. And then she was drawing one day and I looked over and I just thought, wow, that is an amazing skill and I'd love to learn how to do that. And I basically forced her to teach me how That's to great. draw. <laughs> That's really good. So how, how old were you when you sort of had that revelation that you could ask somebody how they did something and they could teach you? That I was in, I was probably nine years old. That's 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 quite something and to think like that at that age. Yeah, I yeah. just thought, oh, you should you, I don't know. I just thought, I've always been interested in learning, always, always, and and I think that that's something that I never really, I always took for granted, mm. and only recently, after having taught been a teacher and then not being a teacher have I realized that if I were to define myself I would define myself as a learner maybe in the creative industry mm. but mm. but as a t as a title I think that makes a lot more sense than mm. to me anyway than artist or teacher or yeah yeah well we're, there's a, there, I'm, I'm interested in this because um, I, I need to ask uh, you to explain something first because obviously people listening would be, um, well, certainly people from this country would think this is a different sounding voice <laughs> to normal um, that we get on, on this particular podcast. So where do you come from? I was born in Alaska. I was born in a hospital called Hope Hospital in Anchorage, Alaska. Oh, Anchorage, okay. And That's um, a name we know. Yeah, you know that, yeah. You yeah. can point to that on the map, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, and I... I don't remember growing up there. All I remember is moving back there when I was 11. So I was born in Alaska, yes. Mm. Lived there, I don't know, as an infant or whatnot. And then my mom moved us to California. All right. So I have a valley girl twang, and that's what the accent is if you're from California, call it valley girl. Um, sometimes, right. if I'm really. Uh, if I'm really being very American, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, so I, I was brought up in California, and that's where I learned to speak, and that's where I have all my memories, until I was aged 11, and we moved back to Alaska. Hmm. So basically, I split my primary school or elementary school um, upbringing. That was Californian, and my high school rest of my you know, high school education was Alaskan. Right, now that, I would, I'm only surmising here, yeah. that that might have been quite a shock. Yes, it was a big shock, um, because I knew I was born in Alaska and we were from there, but I had no memory of that, besides a couple of very, it's just a memories of playing in snow. But, um, and then when I went back, everybody, not every, the children in, I was in grade six by then, and the children were, were sort of, well, you know how children are when something different comes along. They're kind of mean and a little bit like wary of you. And they said that I sounded weird. <laughs> and okay. I was like, I don't sound weird. You sound weird. <laughs> yeah, that's very strange, isn't it? Yeah. 
Yeah, because um, I've, I've, I've interviewed quite a few people and, and I've got an experience that's sort of a little bit, but in reverse to that, because um, I was born in Kent, but I'm, I grew up in Cornwall. Okay. And I moved back at the age of about 11, yeah, yeah. back to Kent from Cornwall, which was a bit like, my God, I just it was, it was a totally <laughs> bizarre experience. And not only that, it wasn't just Kent, it was Dartford. So, oh. um, so it, yeah. it, it was very odd. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I can I can appreciate that, and and, and particularly that that age mm. is is quite a, a seminal moment, really. I think, isn't it? Yeah. So how did you feel that that? What did that do for you? I it well. Here's the thing. Um, growing up in California, I didn't just grow up in one place. We moved around a lot. So I was used to, very used to, and in fact, never knew any different other than to leave a place and come to somewhere new and become someone new. All right. So Interesting. Do you think that's something that, I, I, I sort of know the answer to this, but would you say that is something that you carried on doing? Yes, in various ways, shapes and forms. Right. Um, but that's it's something that I, I was in conscious of. Um, probably maybe the third school. I, I went to like, I don't know, maybe nine different schools before I mm. was in um, year seven. Right. So, uh, yeah, I was conscious of being able to sort of leave behind things that didn't work and Interesting. graft things that did. But the right. thing, that the frustrating thing is, is that I could never fully change and be someone else because I I was myself, you know what I'm saying? Mm. You can't not be yourself. Mm. But uh, I did try. <laughs> well, that's really, that's fascinating because I, I think that that, you know, this often happens when I'm talking to people. Something happens quite early on in the conversation that I think like, oh, you know, a light flashes and it's like, this is very interesting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so then, so you went back to Alaska. Yeah, went back to Alaska. It's an and amazing you, place to... Yeah, avoided the moose and all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The moose and the black bears and... Um, uh, Which is obviously a bit strange eagles. coming from California. Yeah, it, it was... Uh, <laughs> it, it didn't seem... It didn't seem foreign or strange to me. Uh, I don't... I just... Because I'm quite... I'm that type of person that accepts maybe not accepts, but understands that things are different and yeah. doesn't question it as, or kick back. Right. I'm not a person that kicks back. My right. sisters, yes, they definitely. <laughs> right. Definitely, if they don't like something or change or whatever, they'll, they'll be more vocal about it. Right, okay, it's interesting. So, um, your sister's older than you? Or? Younger, so I'm the oldest, and um, so I have a two younger sisters, Sabri, and um, she's the middle, and Teresa, she's the youngest. Right. And that also adds a different sort of dimension to things as you being the oldest, doesn't Yes. It? Yeah, so I had to be the more responsible one. I got in trouble more. Um, I, you know, took care of them because they were littler and they were too long, and, you know, so, um, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> right, okay. So, so what happened then at Alaska? Alaska, so you know, life happened, you know, um, high school happened and all of its awkwardnesses and embarrassing moments and um, fun. I, I think for me, high school was a real equal mix between being happy and not being happy. Right. Where did the, the music and the art come in? At what point? Would you say that? You so I fell in with this crowd in um, in high school in Seward, in a very small town. Seward is where I was living, from year seven onwards up to until I graduated. And um, it's only in the winter time it's thirty five hundred people. In the summertime it swells to like ten thousand because it's a tourist destination. So I lived in a tourist town. Right. But um, the thing about Seward is that it's very affluent in art and music very mm. strong art and music presence. So I did everything art that there was to do, um, connected with the high school, 
um, and I fell in with this um, crowd of kids that were very music musically oriented, and right. we formed a band right. called um, Oh S. De bus non There's no there's no accounting for good taste. I think in Spanish. I'm not sure. But okay. anyway, um, right. there was two older guys. One was a real great jazz guitarist, and um, uh, he was kind of the head of the band. And he had all us high school kids just every weekend or every hour we could spare going over there. I would sing. I played the flute. Um, my sister played the bass and the drums. Uh, so we just busied ourselves because there's nothing else to do unless you wanted to be very active and you know do skiing. Yeah, right. Be away a lot on. So hang on, sports. you just you just said. You played the flute. Where did that? I learned the there, flute. There seems to be a lot of things going on here that we sort of skipped over. So when did you start playing the flute? I started playing the flute in grade uh, maybe grade six. So what's and, that age? Um, that's age yeah ten eleven. Right. 10, 11. And what were you playing anything before that, or was that your first instrument? Um, the flute was my first, I'd say, proper instrument. The guitar wasn't actually um, mine, it was my sister's, but I, I secretly really liked to play it. I wanted to play the violin, actually. And my music teacher um, back in California, she was like, okay, what instrument do you want to play? And I said, I want to play the fiddle, I said, I want to play because I was interested in that sound. And she's like, no, there's too many people playing that <laughs> instrument. You're going to play the flute. And so... I played the flute. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, and you I, were quite happy to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not. A, I don't kick. I wasn't very sort of a questioning type of person. Um, for other reasons, but yeah. So I played the flute, and I wasn't that great at it. But what I liked about it was learning the language of notes. Yeah. And I and like I said, I love learning. Yeah. And um, that piqued my interest to be able to read a book of notes and know how they correlated onto this crazy weird instrument thing, mm -hmm. and to make sense of it to like read a secret language. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. That is that is a very good description uh, of music. Yeah, isn't it? and so my I mean nobody else played the flute or had that experience in my family as far as I know. But I, but later I found out that my mother played the cello, so. <laughs> right, okay. So what about the art? Where did that sort of really kick off? Yeah, so that, um, that's happening in, uh, along with the music, so both, um, always at the same time, always. And um, so in high school, I guess it really kicked off with my um, art teacher. She was the local ceramicist. In fact, her husband is still running the ceramics business, pottery business there in Seward. And she knew all the um, artists that there were to know and were friends with them and had them come in and spend half a year with us woodworking, uh, doing silk, um, silk pieces, screen. silk screening yeah. and on to silk pieces, uh, murals in the summer for big buildings that were being built because um, it was kind of sewer was going through a stage of like building up and becoming more important. Um, and uh, pottery and painting, watercolor, the watercolor artist would come in. So, really intense art and music happening. Tell me a little bit about learning to draw, because you mentioned this to me yes. and it fascinated me. Okay, so learning to draw. Um, I never had a lesson, but I was. Um, like I said, a, um, sort of a grafter. I was very good. I'm very good at mimicking. Right. So I'd find any image I could find anywhere that I thought was interesting or like a picture of a face. I was kind of mainly f pictures of faces. And I would draw them and um, try to figure out how to make it look real. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then my, um, when I moved back, we were closer to my grandmother and she knew that she was, she's an artist, artistic. She loves to paint and stuff. And she noticed that, you know, I really like this. And so she got me a couple of books so I could kind of figure it out better, you know, learn how to do it. Um, and then I had a really good friend in um, high school uh, who was very good at drawing as well. And so I basically, you know, I latched on to that. And 
I am really good at drawing because I drew every day and I tried to make shapes and I don't know, I just I just practiced really hard at it. And I did it a lot. <laughs> yeah, well that's the you see this is what I like about looking at things from a slightly different perspective and then drawing them back to music or whatever. Mm. Because you I find personally that you can see things clearer when you see it over there mm. and then you realise what it means to you over here because yeah. you know? um, sometimes we just get so engrossed within how something is done that we miss sometimes very obvious things that are right in front of us but we can see it over there you know and um, I think that's quite interesting so with what you're saying about grafting you know, that's the same thing as learning an instrument, isn't it, really? Yeah. Uh, it's no different. No. Um, there's a lot of mimicking that goes on. Yeah, definitely. absolutely. Even when somebody looks like they're just a complete natural, it's not, yeah. you know, they don't think it's completely natural because they no. put a lot of hours in. Yeah. Um, and I think that's an important thing. So that, that that's good. Uh, you obviously also had an eye to spotting things, yeah. didn't you? Yeah. From what you said already. Yeah. That you could look at something and go, I like that, I, I want to do that. Or this person's got something that I would like to learn. Yeah. yeah. You know? And I think a lot of people don't do that. No, no. Yeah, no. Well, no, because when you're in that sort of state, you don't do that, hmm. do you? Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, I you, well, you, you do. But what I'm saying, if, well, you, if you're not, <laughs> if you can, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm quite good at asking direct questions to people. Yes. Apparently, I uh, doesn't. I don't realise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't realise that I do that. No, I understand. That. But um, I you know, that. I sometimes it's like I remember. Um, yeah, no, just completely unaware that I was doing that until somebody turned around to me once and said, oh, "I've never had somebody ask me that sort of thing so directly," which it, it was like cause this person had had run a business with somebody and it sort of stopped and it was a bit like it was a bit odd and I just happened to say so what happened <laughs> just literally like that and then no one had been that direct you know yeah. about like well what <laughs> just tell me what happened and it was like I think it was the first like almost like two minutes into a conversation I'd never really met the guy before you know apart from and so, so what happened it's like <laughs> But yeah, but uh, anyway. Oopsie. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, yeah, no. That's, you know, it's a bit like you being able to spot things and, and stuff, and you, you probably don't realise that other people don't necessarily do that. No, yeah, exactly. And um, as I've gotten older, I've, I've understood how... Because I always felt, you know, you, you grow up and you think, you you just accept the world you're presented with, and yes. you think that you are as normal as the next guy. Oh, no. <laughs> and, um, oh, no. I held on to that belief for a very long time, and uh, I've only gradually figured out that, no, yeah, I'm different and unique, in good ways, you know, but it's, I don't think the same as everybody else, you know? I, I, I totally agree. I, I understand that completely from my own perspective, because yeah. you, you think everybody else thinks like you, because why would you not? Oh yeah, why would you not? You know, yeah. and, and and again that works the other way as well when mm. people are, are you know, mm. um, they think everybody thinks like them, but of course we don't. Do yeah. we? You know, but um, so anyway, we got to we're in Alaska. You've worked out how to get all the information about drawing, and and obviously there's quite a lot of references of of music and, and art within your family as well. Yeah, um, different. Um, my different. Mom, um, it's very musical. My grandmother is very artsy. So your mum's musical. Yeah. Um, yeah. She. Uh, she's a not a musical person as as in plays or sings anything, but um, loves music to yeah. listen to music. Yeah. Which I think she got from my grandmother as well because my grandmother's very eclectic. Musical. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And that's what we carry on. So you're in. High school. I'm in high school. Or yeah, secondary that, school. Oh, yeah, I also, yeah. yeah oh, okay, okay, secondary yeah. school. That'll do, that'll do. Yeah. I'm sure people will understand. 
<laughs> it's just me. I can't get my head around. Um, so, so what? You, you, at some point, then you've obviously developed your musical. Yeah, um, I sang, and people thought it's good. So, I did more. I took more opportunities to sing in front of people. Um, uh, see, and from my perspective, I was friends with these guys who were very musical. I was kind of a closet singer, you know, was plucking along on this guitar that I had somebody gave me to take care of and never came back for. And uh, that's just me in my room by myself. And so I, I was always of the opinion that these people, that, that, you know, my friends from high school and their older friends, who was really good jazz guitarists, and that I was uh, under the impression that they were musical and that I was just friends with them and I had, I could sing and nobody else was singing, you know. Mm. But, um, I think maybe the feeling was mutual that they thought, oh, here's a, somebody who can sing. And so now we have the complete package, you know, like we can do. So we did coffee house concerts and we did talent shows and we just got together and played music. That's what we did. Sounds interesting. Sounds really interesting. So it sounds, although to us, when somebody says Alaska, that sounds like a long way away and very remote. Nothing. But there seems to be a lot of stuff going on there. Yes. Um, Lots of places to play. Luckily, yeah, there was a lot of there was a lot going on, and through the teachers that I've had over the years, they really were the catalysts for me to realize my potential. Because otherwise, there was nothing else really. Nobody else really going. Oh, you should, you know playing a, singing a band or oh you should enter that into an art competition these were teachers that were telling me these things and encouraging me and all that kind of stuff which is um, probably why I became a teacher in the end yeah coupled with my you know interest in learning and um, that I had younger sisters that I had already practiced on anyway yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so when did you what happened after high school High school, um, well, I, I wanted to be the first person in my family to get a university degree. So I worked really hard to get some scholarships uh, money to be able to go to university in Alaska. And I um, got enough scholarships and grants to where I had my first two years free. Amazing. And um, you could go, they gave you a grant anyway to go to university in Alaska because every, all the kids were leaving because there's nothing there unless you want to be a geologist, marine biologist, or a forestry worker, um, which are all great, you know, respectable uh, positions. So I went to university still really kind of denying the fact that I should be in music or art because... What were you doing? Uh, what, what did I do in university? I went and I did, well the first year I had to do a lot of uh, makeup courses because um, the high school that I went to was good but not good enough so I was quite lacking in a lot of um, uh, mathematical and oh, okay. that kind of stuff. So I spent a whole year kind of trying to catch up. Then the second year I was able to take one or two courses that I thought were interesting, one of which was art history, oh. and the other one uh, was uh, drawing, introduction to drawing, and life, life drawing, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and this guy, uh, our drawing teacher, he was really good, and he, he basically kicked my butt into gear in terms of bringing my drawing from, you know, doing it by myself to making, you know, making it really skillful. Right. Um, and then I met, uh, well, when I was first there, I met my current partner, Matt, <laughs> and um, that was, it was his uh, last year, my first year, um, and, well, he was from Washington, and I ended up transferring All right. out of Alaska to Ellensburg, Washington, where I then became interested in... Um, well, I was able to take more classes that I wanted, so I took French language, because I like language. I um, didn't take any music. I've never, yeah, so I never did that. I never sort of took the thought of music as a viable career, but um, it was always just a thing I did. Mm. 
and I started um, learning, uh, well not learning, I started a ceramics course basically and I had already done mo loads of ceramics in high school because our teacher was a ceramics, our art teacher was a ceramicist and that's what we learned, we learned clay. And so I um, became the ceramic technician for the university and uh, yeah, I, I finished university at the Evergreen State College. Oh, and you're wearing is, the t-shirt to prove it. Yeah, <laughs> it's my fave t-shirt. It's the alternative university that um, uses uh, self-analysis as their grading system. Okay, yeah, you've got to explain that to me because okay. that sounds... Yeah, that... You could do whatever you wanted at Ellensburg. You could have a degree in whatever underwater basket weaving. Oh, cool! Uh, I've always wanted to know where that yeah. could be done because that's one of the things I've always said. You know, yeah. underwater basket weaving. Kids are sort of like, yeah, you know, you can do um, that at Evergreen. There is okay. a learning psychological space cookery. For that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 great, excellent. Anything you could dream of, you can make as long as you could create a coherent um, course with the relevant research to back it up. Right. So I did that. In um, what? In, well, I did that in studio ceramics because okay. I had transferred again. The, see, this is a theme in my life um, because uh, I was in Ellensburg and that was really far away from where Matt lived, and so I transferred closer. I had to take a year out and work, and but then I, you know, finished up the last two years. I created my own course because they wouldn't let me on the ceramics um, course because it was too full. So I was like, oh. oh my god, you know, this is. I want to be a studio yeah. potter and, you know, yeah. Yeah. I can't, but then I realized that I could and so I created my own course and I did and I worked with the community, to a couple of artists within the community who did very different things in ceramics and um, basically, yeah, I finished the university. <laughs> right. Well, that's, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. So yeah. you finished in university. Yeah. All right. And what happens now? Yeah. Um, I'm assuming you're still singing and playing at this point in time, or is it just... Well, this is a period where um, I don't know if I had a guitar still. I might have. I had. I put it on the back burner because I was busy with um, university and art and ceramics and dogs, in fact. Because dogs, during yeah. university I needed okay. a job and I began to learn how to train animals. Okay, so this is another important... I know this is an important yeah. stream of... Yeah. What you do, so this is, we bring this one in yeah. here. So you you start training dogs. So now this, this seems to be completely <laughs> left field at this point. It is, it really is left field. But it happened like this. So I was. This is after being in Alaska, with and you had, you know, huskies and goodness says what hovering around, and it wasn't then, but it was I, later when you were in yeah, um, Washington. State. Yeah, Washington it was. State? Yeah, yeah, it was later. The training dogs thing was later, but the animal thing. Um, has been a lifelong thing for me. So okay. I right. used to walk home, and this is really sad. I used to walk home an imaginary puppy when I was like eight or nine. That sounds cool to me. <laughs> that sounds really fine. So there's an imaginary puppy oh at the age of eight. Yeah, That's age cool. of eight. He was a beagle, actually, in my oh, mind. Okay. Cool. Um, so did he stop for a cigarette every now? And then? No. <laughs> That is right, and the peoples are useful. Do they? Oh, well, yeah, they for like the sniffer dogs, yeah. Well, no, they used to use them for um, um, scientific experiments on oh, smoking them. I didn't know that, yeah. Well, they've done is so many terrible things or, with beagles. Yeah, beagles, beagles are the ones that That's why are, I said they yeah, have to stop for a cigarette. No, no I was terrible. way too innocent for that. No, this is a... Sorry. No, it's all right. Terrible human. It's funny, though. Yeah, he, he might have. I don't know. <laughs> he didn't let me see. I was too young. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So, I've always been... I've always wanted an animal. And I did end up getting one in high school, right before I went to university. Really silly decision. But his name was a Siberian Husky named Frankie. And we shipped him down to Washington when we moved. And we shipped him over here when we moved over here. But anyway, this dog was the reason why I wanted to learn how to train animals. Because he was impossible. He was very challenging. And I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't like it. Right. I didn't know how to get through to him. And I was like, I know people can, because people do. And I wanted to know how, you know? That's interesting, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. they're big dogs, aren't they? They are, yeah, they're big dogs. But it's nothing to have a Siberian Husky in Alaska. Every other person has a, a no, 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 Husky no, no. or whatever. Yeah, but so I'm just saying they are a big dog. 
And he was a big dog, and I rescued him as well, so he was already big when I got him. Right. I was very devoted to him. Um, yeah. So I needed to know how to get through to him. Because he was very independent. He wasn't that naughty, but he just wasn't... He did naughty things, you know, yeah. chewed things and all that yeah. kind of stuff. And yeah. he didn't walk nicely on the lead. And in my mind, I wanted the beagle that I walked home with, yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah. this perfectly behaved dog. Yeah. Um, realizing now that, you know, that's just not, <laughs> you can't get there without a lot of hard work and knowing what you're doing. So I um, saw this job advert to be a cashier in this place called PetSmart. It's like pets at home. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. There's a big ring in the center of it that, um, uh, there are dog trainers that work there, trained dogs in classes in the center of the store. So eventually I became one of those after a lot of nagging and making them, forcing them to make me go, to have me go to this um, training course. Anyway, right. I, then I did that. I trained, um, I did dog classes in the middle of this giant super store for pets and people would be shopping and watching and, you know. Yeah. And then <laughs> that's right. sort of like... Yeah, I was obsessed with that. <laughs> That's, that is, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I can see. Yeah. <laughs> I can see how that... Yeah, I know, I know, I'm just, I'm so, um... You see, this is I the important thing things, for me. You know, and... When I'm doing this, I, I am interested in these little components that seem, you know, to, to, you, to you, it's like, I don't know, why, I don't know, why did I do that? Why did I get this dog then? I don't do this and I did that, that's a bit embarrassing. But they're really important points about how you arrive at, or perhaps it's not even arrive at being able to do what you can do. Mm. There are elements of people's character that come out in those things, and they're mm. clearer than, yeah, well, I went to this and I did four years doing that, and it was, you know, and it's all t ticking a box type of thing. Mm -hmm. I. It, to me, it's those little, like, well, I always sort of th talk of them as like the anomaly that you want to look for. Mm. You know, it's like, well, if you want to be a great, whatever, guitarist, you do blah, 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 blah. And then suddenly some, you go, but they didn't. And that person is, you know, Jimi Hendrix or whatever. Yeah. You know, the, the people that stand out as being uh, incredible who didn't do any of that stuff yeah. and, you know, if you want to be this, you've got to do blah, 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 you know, the great jazz guitar player, and then you've got Jagger Rommel. Mm -hmm. You know, not only is he a gypsy and couldn't read and write and all the rest of it, he's, he's suddenly only got two working fingers on his fingerboard mm -hmm. hand. And it's like, okay, so explain that. Mm -hmm. So there, that's, I think that the, the, the answer to those things, and that's why I do this, mm -hmm. is in this sort of thing, when you start to look at, I did that, and... I had that focus on, there was a question I needed answered, why couldn't I get this dog to do what I had in my head yeah. about that, and there was a bunch of people over there who could do that, mm. this, is, uh, this is what I'm seeing, right? yeah. uh, let's go and ask them, yeah. right, yeah. and see what I can, you know, see if they can, uh, I'll twist their arm, see if they'll teach me how to do that. And um, and then so lo and behold, there you are. Mm -hmm. You've got it. See, so yeah. So let's pursue this. We we still haven't left America. Well, yet. Uh, yeah, we're in Washington. Cause... So yeah. So <laughs> I graduate university, and I had been. You know, I mentioned I took French in one of the universities I went to. So at Green State College, I did a course in French language and culture, um, alongside doing ceramics and stuff like that, and art history. Um, all extremely useful subjects for like a very successful career ahead of me. Not. <laughs> well, I, I might I was, be. You never know. You never so that's know. Nice you know. Well, yeah, I just I did what I wanted to do. Um, I'm assuming there's but, no yeah. one in the background tearing their hair out at this point. I'm sure there are loads of people. Oh, I don't did, know. You no. you're, not, you're not sure. Matt, Matt always says, well, you know, you do what you want to because you, you do anyway. <laughs> well, that's good. Oh, yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a nice way to... to yeah. Um, um, I've never had somebody directing me. I think some people do have that. Um, but for yeah, better or worse, they have parents who are like, well, maybe this, maybe that. Or 
they, they their parents are more sort of hands on, where they recognize talent in, in a child and then just push them in that direction. I see a lot of never that. have that. Um, I see a lot of that, and I don't necessarily think that's good. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I'm it not could saying be good for the right type of person, but it's not a blanket way to do things. Um, well, put it this way: yeah. people can achieve things. Yeah. Right, because of that. But I am never quite sure what the psychological cost mm. involved mm -hmm. is. Now, I don't know. Yeah. That's that's all I'm saying. Yeah. So, uh, but I see it a lot, and I'm never sure. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah. Let's we'll leave it parked there. Yeah. The <laughs> um, okay. So. So yeah, I, I took this course, and I wanted to um, visit France. A long time dream of mine is to to go and visit. France. Um, I don't know why, it's just something that I I liked. I saw the movie French Kiss when I was younger and I quite liked Meg Ryan and I had my hair cut like that and, and I've always been fascinated by um, uh, French language and culture I guess. Um, mm. But but different, I've been interested in different and um, like, like, you know. So um, we went, we did a two week vacation after I graduated university and either side of that was two days, two days, either side of two weeks in uh, France was in the UK. So we did that, we did the whole shebang. I spoke French for the whole time. By the end of it, I was getting pretty good. Um, and I think possibly the reason why I really liked French and I wanted to go, because um, I had a really great French teacher and encouraged me to go. But also when I talked about this, the secret language of music and notes, it's the same thing for me, for, mm. for understanding something that's mm. uh, almost like, you know, encrypted. Yes. Breaking the code or something like that. But, um, and yes. communication. Yes. Um, but so, yeah, we did that and then we came home. And we were so let down by coming home and realizing that we could both see our lives kind of in front of us. For the, for the rest of our lives. Like we kind of knew what was going to be happening. Yeah. And we started with a question. Everything starts with a question. I wonder how easy and or hard it might be to like go live in a different country, <laughs> you know? And six months later, Matt had a visa a highly skilled, on the highly skilled migrant program to be a um, GIS um, computer guy um, at Deloitte and Touche in London. Right. And I was his partner that he could um, bring along. Now the highly skilled migrant program isn't just Oh, apply. You have to be a certain age, you have to have a certain degree, you have to have um, enough points by meeting certain criteria in order to be accepted into the application, and then you have to find a job. Yeah, we like to make it easy. Yeah. <laughs> Don't know why, because we haven't got the people here to, you know, to, we, we desperately need people from us. Yeah. Whatever you, you see on social media. Mm. Yeah. Well, all the chickens are coming home to roost at you know, all in one go here, I think. You know, right? Yeah. So we'll see what will happen. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's, that's interesting because, uh, so that, again, this is now where you look at that and think that was well timed. Yeah, it was well timed. That's what, you Because know, he was a year out of being ineligible. You see, that's the type of thing, I mean, I, I, this, is, this is a recurring theme. In, in these interviews when it's almost like luck or chance or just happening to be in the right place at the right time with that right thought and this is quite common you know um, which is the other thing that I'm intrigued by with these things so, so you come over to come over here I get a job as an art technician at Wilmington Grammar School for Boys. Yeah, central of the universe. Yep, and um, I meet Louise Wisdom, the head of art there, still is, um, and she recognizes my ability to communicate, connect, and teach art to students, which I didn't really see, because I maybe was taking it for granted, but the, I've always been that way. I've always been, I love learning and I love watching people learn and helping them to yeah. learn. That, that's, it yeah. gives me a thrill. Um, it's really like, you know, 
mundane in a way if you think about it because kids don't like the school they want to learn stuff they just want to do what they want to do you know exactly uh well i mean and here i'm going i love learning yeah yeah i know um interesting because that's probably how i ended up teaching guitar very simple thing and when you see people doing stuff and then you you realize you know how did how because you don't you haven't said this but you ask yourself the question how did I do that and you think oh yeah I did that and you just sort of get them to to have that sort of inquiring mind you only and it doesn't take very long does it you only just need to put things in a particular way for people to get fired up yeah and it's not like you're it's not like you're sort of shoving information down their throat or anything like that no no there's an angle and everybody has a different one and they're infinitely different and it's it's a, a challenge and it's a thrill to find that person's angle. Uh, that that's something that I um, really like to do in for you know students who just thought oh, art's not for me. I'm not good at it. I don't like it. How do I get them to be turned on by something that they they perceive as being not for them? Exactly, exactly. And that is the the, the point I try to put across to other guitar teachers or people angling to be guitar teachers mm. because again you know when people start to tell you how they do things mm. and but they've got a problem because they're whatever it is you know they, they can't keep the, te- the pupil numbers up blah 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 and then when they start to tell you how they teach you think no wonder right because <laughs> it's almost like that sort of thing like i've got the answer yeah. and this is the way we do it type of thing yeah. instead of and this i'm i'm going to sort of maybe paraphrase what you're saying. Yeah. Instead of meeting the pupil on the on the road and seeing where they are, which is like, you know, seeing where they're coming from, mm. what the angle is yeah. that makes them go, ah, you know, I got it, type yeah. of thing. And that is a skill, I think. Yeah. I really do think that is a skill. And I, I don't, feel the same way. Yeah. And I'm not sure, like you've said, how that happens, you know. Yeah, I don't know. No. Some, no. some people, uh, t- I think everybody has the capacity to have that skill. Yes. Some people have it may not know it. I think um, when you realize that that's what's really happening, yeah. that's, that's <coughs> for success in teaching for me was, it, it, at first it was about the art. Who could not like coming in and coloring stuff or doing, like in my mind I was thinking the art, everybody should like it, everybody should love it. Mm. And I was teaching from that perspective. And it wasn't working all the, all the time. No. It wasn't. It wasn't foolproof. No. And I can say that about music. Yeah. Because it's like, well, I'm not going to play a musical instrument. Come on. I know, right? Yeah, we'll see. Right? Oh my Come God, on. it's yeah. so fun. Yeah, exactly. But but yeah. exactly the same thing. You know, if you if you teach from that perspective. It does. It's not it, going it, to no. work all the time. It's not going to be 100 percent successful. No, it, it, absolutely. And then what I realized was it wasn't even about art at all. No. It was about the learner and, um, you know, their capacity to recognize their own learning and to embrace that. Doesn't matter what they were doing, but to apply themselves in a way that meant learning. um, If this is such a lame word, I wish there was a better word for it, but, Mm. you know, like engaging maybe um, to the idea that you could do something and change. Yes. Or build a skill or and then apply that because in art it's all about making mistakes. Oh god. And, yeah, and apply that jokes. that mentality of it's okay to make a mistake, in fact you should make lots of mistakes because mm. it's the only way you're gonna learn. Mm. Like music. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all about making mistakes. Oh yeah. It? Yeah, so, that just? Yeah. <laughs> so that I was, uh, I'm very passionate about that, um, and I discovered that through teaching. I did a master's degree at Goldsmiths, and my thesis was, I, I was actually able to merge two of my very distinct um, passions of dog training and teaching. So I did this paper on what are the similarities between training animals and teaching children. Yes, that's correct. And it came down to behavior. Yeah. It came down to physical movement in a classroom and um, choice of words. Eye contact was very prevalent. Mm. So these sort of similarities, yes. I felt 
And I think that's when I started really thinking about, oh, it's not about the art, it's about this, this way yeah. of connecting and uh, right. engaging and communicating yeah. on levels that are hitting the, the peak interest of you know, children. <laughs> yes. Now, I would say, I could draw comparisons with that and music. Again, this is this sort of thing like, you know, music itself, you said something a long time ago about language, mm. se secret, secret language. Yeah. That's exactly what music is. You know, yeah. It's like you're thinking, well, what's the code? Yeah, what, what is it? All like of that stuff. And, and, yeah. and then go back into this sort of thing, you know. I would say I learned a lot about teaching from watching very young children just doing what they do. Um, you know the fact that a child is, they can barely walk and they can dance right mm -hmm. and you go like right, <laughs> okay and they, they, they can hit something and it's yeah. in time and you look at that and you think okay so what happened between that and and the 40 year old man yeah. who then can't dance in time you know you know yeah, yeah. and, it, and they, they can't do anything musical because somehow they've they've disconnected themselves. Mm. So from my point of view, you, you were saying like animals and, and children. You know, I'd say, well, you know, what's the difference? Mm, yeah. You know, because really there's not much of a difference. Mm. You know, um, and then you know, animals stroke children and adults. What's happened? You yeah, know, and yeah. is there any? How do we get through to the adults? Because they're the ones that have real problems with learning oh, yeah. music and anything because mm. they're so locked down. Oh, they are. They're really shut right? down. Right, yeah. which is partly, you, you hinted at that with regard to, you know, yeah. education. Yeah, yeah. They're so lo locked down. How do we, you know, unlock the cage door so if they want to get out, that they can? You know, which has obviously been what I've been you know, tempted to do with blues camp is a similar sort of thing to that. You know, how do you unlock the cage door? Mm. It? And, and some of them don't want to leave, and some people want to lock somebody else's cage door as well. Mm -hmm. You know, you see all of that. Because they feel insecure to, to escape. Mm. Yeah. So, we get to that, you've done this Masters, and you're saying that... Yeah, you been teaching And that. you put those... And I, I really like that idea that you use... The, teaching do dogs is yeah um, it came I did a three-year master's program and that came to me about here a year and a half in because my tutor was just like Erin you're not doing what you should be doing and I couldn't for the life of me figure out what she was talking about because I was doing everything they asked me to do you yeah. know yeah. and um, I was never uh, really anyway she she knew she knew I never met a person that could look at me and think, you are not doing what you should be doing, and just be blunt to that. She was Australian, maybe that's the thing. <laughs> she Helps. Just, she dressed me down and just been like, you know what, you gotta, you gotta figure it out, because it's not working. Um, well, so it helps that we probably shipped some of her <laughs> ancestors over as prisoners who just did what they wanted to do in the first place. Yeah, that was a hard, a hard three years, but I'm, I'm just so glad I did it. it. Yeah, I wanted to do it. So when, when was the revelation that you suddenly went, oh my God. At the end. <laughs> At the end? At the end, yeah. Okay. So a year and a half in, I started working with, she, she kept saying this to me, I'm like, oh, I don't know. You know, so I thought, okay, well, I'm, I had to sit down and ask myself the questions, which I've gotten better and better at through life, throughout life. Ask yourself the hard question. You know, like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Yeah. and honestly answer it instead of just asking it and let it you know, stay there without an answer so it came to me that I should be you know working within the things that I was passionate about so yeah. dog training and, and teaching children and it was the same thing that I had with my first dog my Siberian Husky Frankie I didn't know how to get through him and I desperately wanted to be really good at that because yeah. I really loved this dog you yeah. know yeah. And um, that's the same as being a teacher. You know, how do you be a great teacher? Uh, how? Some people are and some people aren't. Well, you know, so that, um, I started the research on that, um, researching animal behavior and um, 
teaching techniques and all this kind of stuff and behave in the classroom. So I used I would do these little experiments in the classroom where I pick out like four or I I do four different things for my four year seven classes because year sevens are best at at um, like experimenting with yes. their minds are still yes. on the fence about being yes. locked down or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so I would stand in a certain place for um, asking them to tidy up. And I would stand in a different place in order to give them instructions for something. I would stand in a different place for safety and, you know, like, so there are things they need to know. And so I picked out areas, like if I was chatting with them, I'd have a different way of standing. Yes. If I was So this is, them, for me, that's like the sort of annual P stuff, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. So, yeah, yeah, and, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry. yeah, so I know what you're talking about too, because yeah. um, I had read some NLP stuff as well um, and tried it out. And in the end, I was getting whole classes of really fizzed up year seven boys after lunch being quiet by just looking around the room and making eye contact with anybody who was looking at me and watching out for me and, um, and saying, mouthing the word thank you for being quiet. Yeah. 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 And uh, so that, that for me was like, oh, it's just like animals. Absolutely. It's just like it. It's just like, and it's, you don't have to say much to no. get what you want. No. Even it, I wasn't even talking. I was just like I was standing in the quiet spot. So here's my another spot where I need everybody to be quiet. So I'm giving instruction. And I have a certain way of standing. It'd be like arms crossed, standing very straight, and then looking around, wide eyed, finding those kids looking at back at me, saying thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, and all of a sudden. More of them were quiet, more of them were quiet. And then the ones who were really into their talking, the, the kids around the table would be like, shut up. Just going to say something. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I saw, many years ago, Monty Roberts, the horse whisperer chap. Oh, really? Very, very similar thing about, you know, body language and, and what he could do with these mm. crazy horses. Yeah. Incredible. So, I totally get that. Yeah. Totally get that. Um, so this because there's a few other things I want to because that was really fascinating but there's so many yeah. other things I want to sort of get on to tell me about goats so goats um, okay so I did this master's degree in goldsmiths um, and it went that way it went the way that we were just talking about it, the, this realisation that I should be putting these things together and um, but you, I don't remember if it was before or after this maybe it was after maybe it was before or during even. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I did a nine-month program um, called the Karen Pryor uh, Dog Training Academy. Now, Karen Pryor is a hero of mine in the animal behavior world. She is a disciple of um, Bailey. What? Um, you know the dog? Is it Bailey? The dog? <laughs> I can't even remember. The Baileys. Pavlov. Oh, Pavlov talks about The Baileys, yeah. who were also uh, yeah. uh, students of Pavlov. Yeah, right, okay, students. got you. Yeah. Okay, so how to train your animal without um, even ha touching it, really, to, to this behavioral thing. Mm. Anyway, so it finally came over here to the UK, and it's called clicker training. I'm sure you've probably heard of it. Um, but anyway, it's, a, it's really big in the US. And um, Karen Pryor, as a, as a behavioral scientist who started her career out working in animal psychology and working with dolphins, teaching them how to do the tricks that you oh, do right, in the sea world. Yeah. So how do you teach a dolphin to jump through a hoop? Yeah. Yeah. Lots of fish in a whistle. Yeah. Yeah. Can't touch it, can't talk to it in you know like mm. conventional ways, mm. can't get close to it. Mm. How do you do it? Mm. So um, anyway, you should look her up, Karen Pryor, she's an interesting woman. But I did this program that was focused on training people to become dog trainers. I'd been training dogs already for a long time and been reading lots about um, you know, this method of doing things, incorporating it into my teaching, all that kind of stuff. And um, so I did this program with my current dog, Toy Poodle Edith. Um, and that's how I became, um, that's how I trained goats. That's how I got into, so, so in- Okay, so I'm just trying to work this, where's the, well, there's a bit of a jump here. Yeah. Um, between dogs and goats. So. Not really. Right, okay. Because animals, 
whatever animal it is, you can train it using this method. So mm -hmm. there's where the connection is. Right. So as part of this program, um, besides training Edith, a full range of behaviors, I had to train a different species. Oh, right. Okay. Using the same methodology. Right. So uh, we didn't have any fish or cats or birds. And um, I knew there was Buttercup's goat sanctuary down the road, and I thought, oh, we want a goat. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> That's brilliant. So anyway, what did you manage to get these goats to do? Well, so um, I went down there, pitched my what I wanted to do, and they were like, yeah, sure, go for it. <laughs> you know, here's a pen. Um, interestingly, at the same time, there was a um, scientist, scientific group from Canterbury um, studying the same goats that I was training and asking them, asking questions like, do goats have feelings? Um, I never got to sort of All right. follow that up, but um, I do have the contact of the guy that did that study. But anyway, do goats have feelings? Anyway, so I went there, I picked out a goat, Nadia, the Nubian goat. She was a gorgeous goat. Um, and I trained her to fetch a That's frisbee. That's like something like Game of Thrones. Nadia the... Nadia, the Nubian. The Nubian. The gorgeous white Nubian. Right. Um, so yeah, and I picked out another one, Reggie, and Matt came along and he did some training with Reggie. And he was just a little tiny, little, a small garden goat, you know. Um, yeah, I trained her to fetch. I trained her to... Um, touch a target anywhere I put it. it was just a target is just a piece of colored paper. Right. Trained her to nod her head if I said, do you like buttercups? She'd nod her head yes. Right. Okay. And um, I trained her to twirl around both sides, um, to walk away from me, and to come back to me. Right. Right. In, in what period of time? For a couple of months, maybe like I didn't have much time, maybe three months, four months. Mm. Yeah, she and every time I came, she spotted me from you know across the field and would start bleating and running. It's amazing. <laughs> and I trained her with dried pasta. Right. Okay. Yeah. Why not? I don't know why not. Yeah, I know. It's, it's just it's crazy. It's the whole concept is just nuts. But I'll tell you what, goats far easier to train than dogs. Amazing. That is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that probably really answered the. Um, you've managed to nail the University of Canterbury's uh, thing about do they have feelings? It's obviously do because she got excited every time you turned up. Oh yeah, she was really up for it. Exactly. And so then all the other goats started coming around, being like, "What's going on here?" Yeah, <laughs> <You exactly. know? laughs> Yeah. And so in the end, I had to put like I had to find a really tall container space that nobody, and I had to hide, coming in, I had to hide myself so that none of the other goats would see me. So, yeah, see, look, <laughs> all these people from Canterbury <laughs> trying to do some amazingly complex thing and you sort of sorted it out. Oh, uh, yeah, I've just got some dried pasta and a goat that, <laughs> that will do anything for it. Amazing. Um, just direct that curiosity. So, yeah. the next question, because we have to watch our time a little bit. Yeah, um, I do have to take it yeah, yeah, so I've got to ask about the music, because we haven't, you've done all of that, and you've not said anything. About no, I know, that's the way it is in my life. Um, I always do music, but it's never been a thing in the front, it's never been the thing which is the priority. But you do a lot of stuff, don't you, do because you write stuff. songs. And you so I write my own songs. You play, you perform. Um, yeah, I play, I've got three weddings coming up, just uh, like, you know, drinks, an hour and a half. Nothing, nothing special. Um, so I picked, uh, we moved here and I um, didn't have a guitar and I finally got one. And first chord I played was a G chord and then I let out a really long breath as if I was holding it in for a really long time because I thought, oh, I just can't live without having one. Mm. Can't live without not playing music. Mm. So I started, you know, so I just did, I just played, played and played and played. And then one day Matt was like, that is a really good cover of that song. Mm. You should, you should videotape it or put it on YouTube or, you know, you should do something with that. Mm. So he sort of encouraged me into the idea of mm. performing. And then I joined a bluegrass band and we performed. And then I joined another one after that. And we got more successful in Hastings area. And then that band broke up. And I joined your band. Yes, you did. Yeah, and then that sort of, you know, fizzled out. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then I realised that I just really should just do it on my own. 
Well, the thing is, you don't have to deal with guitarists. So. Yeah. <laughs> True. Oh, my golly. And so I thought, you know, there's, I, I think by that time I'd built up enough confidence to be able to, to be able to do it by myself. Yes. I think I that's the thing. Yeah. So I, I think, did like six months of open mics. Because it is difficult, isn't it? You've got nothing to hide behind. No, you don't. And it's nerve wracking. And so I started getting gigs. And um, uh, yeah, it's just been t sort of fizzle, teetering along. I've not made anything big out of it. Well, you're doing quite a lot of stuff, I think, on a choir. I think you're, you're yeah. not playing your hand here. Um, but um, I focus more on making my own music. Yeah, so I know you've been doing a lot of stuff year, on that. So. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's, you know, because obviously if you think about the way that things seem to work for you, it does seem to happen that um, you sort of fall into situations where things sort of work. Yeah. It's like there's no grand plan. No, there is no grand plan. I, I was desperately trying to be de wish there were. No, but it probably <laughs> wouldn't work for you. That's what I'm saying, you see. Yeah. And I've heard there's somebody else who I was listening to. I don't know this person, but they were a professional singer-songwriter, you know, touring musicians in California yeah. um, back in the you know, 70s. Right? Yeah. And then they stopped doing that and they had a family and he started writing books and all the rest of it. And then he was given an old ukulele. And then he started playing, you know, and thought, well, actually, it's a bit similar to guitar. These, these strings are, so, you know, and it was like, but then he, strangely enough, he came to England doing a tour of something like that. It was nothing to do with music. And somebody gave him a guitar to play on while he was here. And then that was it. So by the time he'd finished this little tour, book tour, whatever he was doing over a case of a month, mm -hmm. he was back with all the guitar stuff. Mm -hmm. So we went back to America, he bought a guitar and then started performing. And now this guy is doing gigs in Japan. And you can like... This is bizarre because he's coming. He's coming yeah. back at it from another perspective as being a, a somebody who writes books who just happens to play music. So it, it's sort of odd and and strangely, I've again I've interviewed a couple of people who had a very similar thing where they started off, did a lot of stuff early on, yeah. stopped, had another life, and then came back again mm -hmm. later. And I think well, that's that's another sort of recurring thing here. And I'll, which I'm quite interested in because this idea of, you know, how music could be very useful for either somebody's sanity later on, yeah. you know, when they realise, look, I made this career choice and perhaps it wasn't the best <laughs> thing to do, you know, um, but, and, and so on. So I'm quite interested in, in all the ways that music can do things for people. Yes. You know? It's given me confidence, definitely. Um, teaching did that as well. I think I couldn't. I don't think I could be doing what I'm doing now with my music had I not been a teacher. Because I've I've thought about it a lot, and I thought, in a way, I spent I spent ten years in in schools, seven years in one school, which is the same amount of time that you spend going through elementary and high school, and I had such a patchy, difficult time. My on my own in school that in a way I felt like I had done it again but under under circumstances that were better mm. I guess mm. so after that after I had that I had that realization about two years before I quit teaching and it made me feel like I, I was done yeah yeah because I realized why I was doing it and what I was there for yeah. I was there to re redo it the way that Yes. I wanted. That's that's yeah. I think that's very perceptive you know, to see things like that. Yeah. I needed actually. I think I needed that to happen. Yeah. yeah I needed yeah. to do. It. See, I'm always interested. This is why, you know, I thought this would be an interesting conversation. Because you haven't travelled a path that I've seen anybody travel. You see. Yeah. Which I think is fair. Comment. Yeah. 
Right. I think you, you, probably, you can probably sort of see that for yourself, that you think, no, I don't know anybody else has done it quite like this. No, no exactly. So. I'm still figuring it out. Yeah, yeah exactly. But you, the, the point that I'm getting at is that that is the thing that holds the secret to a lot of stuff. You know, when it looks like, well, we've followed the textbook thing, mm. you don't get where the, the actual gems are mm. in what's going on. Um, and when people take a different course of action to get to a place, then I think it teaches you a lot more about, you know, even as an observer, about what some of the what some of the skills are that maybe we sort of need mm. in order to sort of go, okay, so what do we need to do? Well, we certainly need to put the time. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to take take maybe risks and. And take opportunities when they arise instead of it being like, well, no, that's a bit, you know, it's a bit risky type mm -hmm. of thing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and let's see what happens when I do that. And let's try this out. And that sort of didn't work, but maybe it would work if I did this. And, you know, and you know, what's the best way of learning how to you know, train dogs? Well, let's train some goats. Yeah. You know, that sort of thing that's slightly left field. I think it's an important thing. So, what do what are your plans? So my plans are to um, finish, I made um, a 12 song album, um, seven songs in, um, so finish that, um, make videos to post on the, I have a little YouTube channel and a little Patreon channel, yeah, I'm right. just sort of chipping away at it. Yeah, um, Patreon's a bit of a slow burn. Isn't it? Yeah it is, um, I've got this, I'm t in my mind I'm doing this because one, I want to, obviously, and yeah. I like writing songs and music, and it's fun. Um, but also, I want to get something out there for my family. So I'm yes. not worried about gaining fans or anything like that. No, that's good. But then when it's done, I might rethink what yeah. I could do. Yeah, but I think that's a very good point. Actually. So my family are all my patrons at the moment. <laughs> yeah, <but good. laughs> Because yeah. why not? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because they've always encouraged me, and they, they have no idea why I'm not a crazy famous rock star, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. so yeah. I've, I had different ideas, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but, um, so yes, I'm still doing that, uh, because I can't not do it. Uh, yeah, I think that's the other important ingredient. Yeah. Because th that, you know, historically, when you look at people that are very success success successful musicians, they just have to do it. It's not because they want to be successful it's just they have to do it they have to play yeah. you know just like an artist has to paint or draw mm -hmm. you know it's, it's not something you can actually choose no you see what I mean? yeah definitely you know and I think that is, you know it's not it's, it's like a career choice type of thing it's like well it isn't a career choice you know <laughs> it's that's just the way it is type yeah. of thing. and I think that's again something else we sort of got slightly wrapped around our necks really Definitely. You know. So, there's a little traditional last question, which is, um, if a younger you mm. met up with you now, what words of advice would you have for a younger you? I would say that you... Oh my God, that's a really tough one. I would probably say something about being true to yourself, Pick, picking, not, not even picking, but just, it's gonna turn out all right. Well. And whatever it is you think you wanna do, you should do it. Right, without, that's without. That's right, yeah. Right. Nobody ever gets a chance to, because no. I never tell them that. Oh my God. But it is an interesting point, isn't it, when you look at that? You think, oh my God, you know, why did I think like that when I was younger? Because, I know, yeah, you know, as it turns out, these things happen. Yeah, because yeah. the life is, when you're younger and you're trying to figure out who you are, it's really hard, especially if you have things going on in your life that are big and disruptive. Mm. Exactly. And, you know, and that's what, that was me. I had a really disruptive upbringing. Well it sounds like it when well, you moved around a lot didn't you? Moved around a lot, family troubles, lots of issues. Yeah. 
that weren't necessarily me, but no, no, put because it. they were happening around me, it yeah. was very difficult to yeah. to be confident or Absolutely. to trust my emotions or to to know that everything is going to turn out okay yeah. and that I should just do what I I want to do. Yeah. 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 Interesting point. Yeah. So, um, how can people find out about you? You've got a Patreon and all that. Yeah, I'm on the. I have a website. Right. At the moment, my name is <laughs> Ari Sanavi, all one word, but I'm changing it. <laughs> right. This is a, this is another aspect that we didn't actually discuss because you you've got a multiplicity of I names. I do. I will never. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, that's I'm that's thinking, great. I'm it's thinking good. of changing it, but at the moment it's Ari Sanavi. I was going to change it to Arinella because I thought it sounded like a friendly monster cartoon monster okay but also it has to do with Ella Fitzgerald which I quite um, yeah, enjoy nice singing yeah but I don't know you know we'll that's, that sounds like a nice <laughs> idea so but I'm erisanavi.co.uk right okay um, but I can and, you and is that your, is, and your patron and everything sort of linked to that, that yeah it's on there that's all on there and there's some some samples of singing and stuff like that I need to get Matt to put current stuff on there because I have some better songs too. yeah yeah, 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 great, good. Well, that well, that was that was a wonderful uh, chat. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Wish you all the best for what you do, and um, you know if you find any other crazy um, animals that you want to train, we've got a very crazy cat actually, which um, oh yeah, mm -hmm. doesn't need a bit of training. Yeah, so interesting. Yeah, might need your assistance on that one. Thank anyway, you. it's lovely to speak to you. Lovely to speak to you too, Vic. It's been an honour.